effective than just being uh, water barriers for, um, for the virus particles. And then around the world, 3D printer manufacturers and medical professionals are collaborating to design ventilator parts, face shields, and other protective equipment for uses in hospitals. And the designs are being shared for free online, which is kind of cool. There's also code being shared online through GitHub, which is also kind of cool. Um, and the prototypes are being submitted to the governments around the world for approval. Um, and a 3D printer in Europe was even used to build isolation wards. So they're printing little uh, pods for people to recover in. Um, the first 3D mask, um, printed mask, was just approved by FDA this week for a liquid barrier protection um, for medical workers. It was designed by the Veterans Health Administration Innovation Ecosystem. And it kind of looks like uh, just a regular respirator mask, um, but um, it's 3D printed, making it a lot easier to deliver it. Um, at Mass General, the medical residents are planning an online open moonshot competition to develop rapidly deployable mechanical ventilators. They want to have them out in 90 days and that either be designed to serve multiple patients at once or be easily replicated so that the units can be produced quickly. Down the street from there at MIT, they've basically been working on the same idea and they're about to roll out a new low cost ventilator that is made largely with 3D parts. Um, around the country, um, local companies, seamstresses and other people are making masks for the general public so that the particular masks um, can be uh, used by, you know, the very protective ones can be used by medical staff. Um, I saw some really great stories about uniform companies that have pivoted to making masks and they ran out of elastic to make the earpieces and they ended up using hair ties, which I just thought, well, that's creative. So Amazon delivered hair ties and the masks continued to be produced. Um, in Tampa Bay and elsewhere, alcoholic beverage manufacturers are producing hand sanitizer. We had that done in St. Pete. They've been doing it in Tampa. They've even been doing it in the Virgin Islands. You, your, our bread food vodka company is producing hand sanitizer on the island of St. Croix. So that's pretty exciting. Um, let's see. For treatments, now this one, th this is all over the place. So I'm going to kind of break it into diagnostics and then treatments. So starting with diagnostics, um, social innovators are using technology to diagnose and treat COVID-19. In Jordan, um, Altibi, a digital health platform that provides services in the Middle East and North Africa, is partnered with the Jordanian government to do a free telehealth hotline where Jordanians can call 111 and they're connected to certified doctors to be assessed at home for COVID-19 so they don't have to actually go out and get exposed. And meanwhile, um, in Africa, Semprints, which is a biometric data company, has successfully deployed its biometric patient ID system with health, health workers in 12 countries and is adding a contactless mode that has demonstrated high levels of accuracy in field tests in Africa. And so the, what's cool about that technology is it would be a, a way to easily track um, patients and disease surveillance in parts of the world with limited med medical infrastructure. So you'd be doing it remotely instead of having to have contacts with medical facilities. So that is pretty cool. Um, hey, we hold can, on a second. Yeah. Hold on. Deep breath. Which link was that one? I that think one. That oh, on I'm, yeah, I'm jumping around. I'm jumping, jumping around. around. I'm sorry. I'm jumping around. I gave her a list of links and then I'm screwing her up. Okay. That's <laughs> the one. That's the uh, one that's weforum.org second one down on the COVID-19 treatment list. Okay, got that one. Okay. I got that so, one. Okay. Okay. So, okay. 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 So I'll, I'll tell you when I go backwards. Okay. So okay. then I'm going to the next one, which is the weekend one weekend before last. Okay. okay. The, um, there was a virtual hackathon based out of Germany that had 40,000 participants around the world, which is kind of cool just in and of itself that 40,000 people got online for two days to do a hackathon. Um, and it generated 800 ideas for programs and equipment to fight the virus. So that's just, and, and then uh, those are being sorted through right now and the top 50 are going to actually get funding from the German government. So that's pretty cool. Um, the, um, now I'm skipping down to the FDA Abbott one. Um, the FDA gave emergency approval to Abbott Laboratories for a molecular point of care diagnostic tool 
that can diagnose, diagnose the virus in five minutes in a physician's office. So no more drive-by testing. You go to your own doctor. Um, they can swab you basically and do a molecular test to determine if you've got the virus. That's pretty handy. And similarly in Europe, this is Veritas Labs, has released uh, diagnostic tools that does the same thing using a nasal swab, except that they're doing molecular fingerprinting for the virus um, while they're doing that and then gathering that data for um, use in research, which is kind of cool. Um, and finally, on the diagnostic side, ZTE in China said that they used the new 5G system in China using 5G hardware outdoors and an indoor 5G base station to transform a West China, comp China hospital conference room into a remote diagnosis and treatment center that served the entire region. So that's the future of 5G as it rolls out. Now, going backwards, Jen, to the very top of the list of <laughs> COVID-19. So the, this, this one right now that I'm going to tell you is my favorite favorite on this list for a couple of reasons. One, I get to say billion billion, which is fun to say. But um, basically, the, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but there's something called the Folding at Home Distributed Computing Project. Do you know about, does anybody know about that? Okay, so it's a computing project where they are essentially distributing out to citizen scientists um, projects and then have the citizen scientists use their own bandwidth to work on the project. So right now, um, the project they put out was to search for protein structures that drugs could target to fight COVID-19. And what's so exciting is so many scientists are actually participating that a billion, billion calculations, which is an exaflop, if you're looking for cool new words, um, are being run per second, um, which makes the calculations faster than the world's largest supercomputer. So just think about that for a minute, that that, that many people are devoting their time for free to try and look at protein structures to find a way to fight the virus. So I just, that was my favorite story of the week, I have to tell you, but I'll keep going with the other ones. Um, going back down the list to the John Hopkins story, um, Jen, John Hopkins developed a convalescent serum therapy to, to treat COVID-19 using blood plasma from recovered patients. The FDA has fast-tracked the approval to start clinical trials, and the hope is that the therapy would be used to protect healthy frontline medical workers um, by making them resistant to the infection despite the exposure. So basically it's like a blood plasma version of a vaccine, which is kind of cool. And then another, there are a couple of vaccines that I've heard about, but the only one I could find an article about particularly um, is the one that Inovio is doing. It's backed by the Gates Foundation and it's been approved to go into clinical trials. So if that's successful, the vaccine could be approved as early um, as this summer for pilot use. So that's pretty exciting too. Um, okay, moving on to the next thing. Hold on, I didn't do my slides, my pretty pictures. So that was COVID-19 treatments with my little molecular picture, in case anybody likes to do PCR work. That's something I do actually like to do, it's fun. Okay, so drones, yay drones. Okay, so another one of my favorite things. Um, so around the world, drones are being used for a lot of different things related to the, um, to the virus. One is to monitor traffic, both pedestrian and vehicle traffic, to try and track where, whether people are complying with the um, stay home orders. To, in China, they were used to broadcast messages in parks telling people to put face masks on. Um, They've been used to sterilize spaces um, and air, outside areas and inside areas by spraying um, antiseptic stuff. And they're being used to deliver medical supplies and other goods through contactless, contactless delivery. So that's both inside spaces and then also just delivering packages to the outside of buildings. Um, DJI, which is one of the major drone manufacturers and actually makes the drones I use for my work um, in the islands, um, put, has drones that have infrared cameras and they were used to monitor body temperature at screening checkpoints in China. And then another drone they modified that was designed to do crop monitoring. It was modified to use to spray for control for infectious disease. And they tried it first with anti-malarial uh, spray, but they're moving on to trying to figure out ways they can use it for coronavirus. 
Locally, our member, Zing Drones, um, has ramped up its contactless list restaurant delivery services. If you haven't gone to their Facebook page, they have video of uh, delivering different restaurant meals um, via drone. So that's pretty cool. And then in Australia, they've taken it a whole nother level. Um, the Australian government has purchased drones from Dragonfly. Um, and they're going to be used to monitor temperature, like human body temperatures outside, coughing and sneezing through remote sensing technology. And then they're hoping to identify potentially individuals, ill individuals, to um, slow the spread of the virus in Australia by getting those people into quarantine quickly. So, I mean, it's a little um, big brother-ish when you think about it, but at the same time, it's cool that there is technology out there that can hear you sneeze and tell you you are sick, which we'll get into that because there's another technology I found that does that as well. So, moving on. Artificial intelligence, machine learning. Now we're getting into the seriously nerd chic stuff, which I love, 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 love. Um, so, they're being advanced to monitor social movement and to track disease using facial recognition software which is kind of cool. So if you're identified, um, this has obviously been rolled out in China first. Um, if you've been identified, because they're doing it for regular social controls as well. Um, but if you've been identified as a potentially sick person, then you can be picked up in the facial recognition system and they know where you're moving. Um, there's a company called Blue Dot, which um, is an infectious disease surveillance company that uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to review 100,000 articles in 65 languages each day. And what it's searching for is 100 different infectious disease um, notices that are reported in the news. And they also use airline and other transportation data to predict how a disease will spread once it's been reported in the news. So Blue Dot actually successfully identified the coronavirus before the World Health Organization identified it as a pandemic using this technology. So think about that for maybe not for this disaster, but for future pandemics and future viral, if we can use this AI technology, we may be able to catch things earlier and not go into a global lockdown like we are right now, which is interesting. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine in Kiev um, last night and uh, she was like, yep, here we are in Kiev, in our apartments. There you are in Florida, in your apartment. She's like, the world is a funny place right now. And it's like, yes, it really is. Um, another company, Metabiota, um, monitors online chat rooms and forums using the similar kind of AI technology to, um, to predict the level of social and economic disruption associate, associated with any particular infectious disease outbreak. So their technology is not really about identifying where the disease is, it's about identifying how the disease is affecting society and trying to avoid um, mass panic and those kind of things, which is again, an, both on the big brother side of things, kind of scary, but on the, on the practical side of things, that, that is actually kind of exciting that that's doable with computing. Um, the other uses for AI that I found include uh, planning the distribution of medical supplies by um, predicting the rates of infection in different communities so that governments can spread the limited supplies out um, appropriately. Um, at MIT, um, this is the next one, Jen. At MIT, a group of computer science researchers have voluntarily collaborated with the Boston biotech community to use machine learning to identify promising antiviral molecules and drugs that are already in development and under trial to see if those uh, experimental drugs can be used to treat COVID. Amy, so hold on just one second. Amy, please. Um, so, sorry, household interruptions. Um, so the um, several other health startups have using, started using chat box chatbots to diagnose disease via text, which if you think about it, I mean, I think about chatbots as shopping choices, you know, how can I help you today kind of choices. Um, th these are actually asking fairly smart questions about disease. And then if you give any of the symptoms that could be coronavirus, they start asking questions about uh, travel and ex potential exposure paths to the virus to help identify whether you have a flu or whether you have coronavirus. So far, the chatbots have been more accurate in identifying flu, and so it's more of a false 
It's a, they're excluding people from having coronavirus correctly more than specifically identifying people with coronavirus, but still that's useful to find out you have a flu instead of coronavirus. So that's kind of exciting. And then there's a company called FluSense um, developed at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst that has developed this portable device that listens. This is the second listening to people sneeze device in the world um, that listens to sniffles and sneezes in waiting rooms of doctor's offices to identify people that are potentially um, sick and need to be isolated in the waiting room to avoid further exposure of other patients. Kind of a handy technology. So if you go into your doctor's office and you see a strange box listening to you, maybe they're seeing if you're sniffling. Um, Athena Security, um, and I thought this one was kind of funny just because of the technology they're adding it to. So they have a gun detection security camera, which I imagine must use a combination of um, infrared and um, bulking, you know, visual plus infrared technology. But they're adding to that um, the technology to um, see if people have fevers as they're walking into office buildings. So the suggestion is that um, in the future, if these get ex installed widespread, they'll be able to do low-grade monitoring and risk assessment before things get out of hand, which is kind of cool. So um, moving on to robots, another one of my favorite subjects. Um, I have a couple robot stories. If anybody else finds robot stories, let me know, because I love robot stories. They're, they're some of my favorites. Um, so the robotics engineers are working on a variety of projects that utilize robots as healthcare providers um, and to provide social interaction to those that are isolated at home um, by the virus. Um, so basically the article was talking about the fact that people are lonely and they may need to have a robot to talk to because the robot can't get the virus. Um, so that's kind of you know, very Jetsons, you know, <laughs> as we're kind of going along. But, um, but anyway, um, more practically in China, robots were used to deliver supplies in hospitals to limit the contact between the medical professionals and the sick people in the rooms. So the robots would go in and deliver trays of medicine and trays of things. Um, they kind of looked, um, I saw a video of it. I didn't put the link to the video because I couldn't find it last night, but I, they kind of looked like um, little, uh, I don't know, little butlers. They had their little trays like this and they kind of went in, rolled in, went like that, went like that, and people took the stuff off the tray, which was kind of cool. Um, Dimer UVC Innovation has created the Germ Falcon robot um, to sanitize airports and airplanes. Um, the robot is designed to navigate through planes and, and cover all surfaces with UVC light to kill surface bacteria and viruses. That may just be exciting to me because I fly a lot, but that sounds like a really cool technology um, to uh, have access to if we can get them spread through the airports. Um, so that was kind of what I found, but if you're feeling particularly innovative, I found three sources of money for people to go try and do their own innovative things. On, uh, on the fourth, uh, the National Science Foundation um, particularly released that their rapid response research grants um, for up to $200,000 are being are encouraged to be applied for for doing COVID-19 related um, research to inform and educate about the science of virus transmission and prevention to encourage the development of processes and actions to address the global challenge. So if you have a plan, submit it to NSF. Um, there's one that if you really have a fast plan, it's due today. So um, is the Roddenberry Prize application. It's a $1 million prize that gets divided between four groups. Um, and, and it usually is available for either an education, science, environment, or humanity. This year, the foundation is strongly encouraging applications to address the range of societal health and economic repercussions of the pandemic. So, but that's due today. So you'd have to really work hard to get that all knocked out. Um, and then finally, um, there's a, an accelerator startup generator called Antler that normally operates in about 15 countries around the world. Um, they have issued a global remote uh, call for startups to join Antler um, to contribute, and they want the startups to tackle COVID-19 by contributing to recovery, um, proposing solutions like masks, contact tracing, surveillance, data infrastructure, medical equipment, 
um, remote health or digital tools to use to fight COVID. Um, that one is due April 15th. So if you want to be part of that gener that uh, startup accelerator program, um, that one is there. All of the links are those. And then finally, because we're in Florida, I wanted to point one thing out. OJ sales are up. So I just want everyone to know that the U.S. sister industry has announced that they are responding to the demand. And during the month of March, orange juice sales up were nationally 25%. So drink your orange juice, stay healthy. And that's it for my report of good news. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Yeah. So I don't know what I'll do ne next week. Huh? Trying to talk about them if anybody wants to talk. Oh yeah, we have plenty of time. I just ran through them, so. Didn't you mention something about Abbott Labs? Yeah. Was, that, was it Abbott Molecular that was working on stuff? I think so, yeah. I've got the link into their, um, to their uh, press release. But yeah, it's, um, it's a, uh, basically it's taking one of their existing pieces of equipment that does, um, you know, molecular scan and they just repurposed it to use it to do this particular test, which, you know, Abbott's expensive, I won't lie, but, um, but. I the reason I bring it up is because I worked on a project for for the molecular division when they were splitting off. Yeah. And literally did a coffee table book for them and was in those was in the facilities and stuff. Oh, cool. So you probably saw where they were making this stuff then. Yeah, and there's there's I mean, there was rooms, you know, I was I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they tell you what room you're in. I mean, we had to go out there and do photo shoots, you know, on location and everything and yeah. go in some rooms that I was like, I can't go in there, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're perfectly fine. But yeah, actually the book's on my website if you want to see it, but it's, um, it's in that Abbott, yeah, Abbott Molecular. Cool. Yeah, well, that, I the link. It's in there of the press release. Yeah. I'll, just, well, I'll post it. Slack and stuff so you can follow the links a little easier. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I, I am going to post a blog version of this um, on um, the my law firm website. Um, so if you want that, the links that way all in one document, that's a way as well. And Jen will put it out in Slack too. Cool. What I wrote is not in the same order as what I said though. So, you know, you'll have to jump around a little bit. But, um, but yeah, but I still, I'm the most exciting one to me was just the, the concept of enough citizen scientists being on computers, using their own bandwidth to do protein structure analysis, that, pretty that, cool. that, yeah. that it's faster than supercomputers. I just want to point out that it's uh, International Siblings Day and my brother is dressed like he's in the 18th century right now. So um, I just want to say hello to my brother. Happy International Siblings Day. Um, so I don't know why we're graced with that beautiful outfit, but I love it. So um, just wanted to make you smile. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Happy day. Happy, Happy day. day. You're, just you. you're trying to be different. Yeah. <laughs> so it works. I definitely seen lots of calls where people are like, I've seen like women, like, like parent groups or whatever getting together and like they all like wore their like wedding dress. <laughs> and people were like wearing their like ball gowns to take the, the bins, the garbage bins out. And I definitely have seen a lot of that. Yeah. Well, there's I'm going to walk like, my dog with a lion collar. In my <laughs> master outfit. Yeah, I think that's park. awesome. I think that's perfect. I think you need to do that. Everybody needs joy and happiness right now. Well, one thing that was kind of cool just hearing about all that news is, is how many people are really coming together and like ASAP and just really jumping on this. And right. And that to me was the part that made me feel great is that the science community is like on it and they're, and they're doing a lot of this stuff like the MIT researchers, MIT shut down. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're doing this on their own. Like they've just created these little unofficial groups that are out doing this stuff. And then MIT is like, Hey, that's cool. Who knew yeah. you guys were over there socially distancing and collaborating and doing cool things. So yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was reading articles too about um, the scientists, uh, you know, that are studying this and they're sharing information where, you know, in the past, they're all trying to get their papers published and everything and they're so they're always competing and they're not as likely to share information.
but because it's so important right now, you know, timing wise to get to whatever's working. Yeah, no, and at, um, at up at John Hopkins, um, I'm, I'm in a program at John Hopkins right now, so I get all their feeds. Um, because they're doing a lot of the cutting edge research, um, they made a call out to the general, you know, university community because they needed per personal protective equipment put together for their employees, you know, assembled. And just random students came in and created an assembly line to start building PPE for them so that they could continue to do the research. So, I mean, I think it, that part is really heartening to see that the world is willing to really do that. And it's global. I mean, yeah. that, that's what's really cool. I mean, think about 40,000 people on a hackathon in Germany. I mean, you know, that's just, that's a lot of people. That's like a, a city's worth of people, you know, small city. Right. So anyway, all very happy, good news. It's all going to lead us to be able to leave our homes at some point in the future. <laughs> so. I went out yesterday, uh, first time I wore a mask. Yeah. Uh, just a homemade one. My mom sent it, but it was, at first it was a little kind of weird, but then once you saw like half of the other people wearing them, like this was at a grocery store. Like yeah. It, it, I mean, wasn't, it wasn't as bad. I went out yesterday and I did some stuff at the office and I went downstairs and got lunch and I actually like peer pressure, like social pressure works. I was like, I felt like such a jerk because I had forgotten my mask <laughs> and I like went out and I like felt like a real jerk because I, I like, I like my sewing machines like right here. That's literally my mask, right? Like I've been making masks. Yeah. For loved ones and uh I like it legitimately legitimately have one made one cool uh forgot forgot to like even like think about it yesterday when I left, left the house so yeah well Amy I went I left the house for the first time in like a week yesterday at midnight to go pick Amy up at the airport which it was surreal there was Amy and two other people total wow. waiting to be picked up and so, first of all, so you're driving through the airport and you have that moment that it feels a little bit like one of those m movies where like the world has ended and you're somehow left the last person standing kind of deal. Right. Like that Will Smith, Smith moment. What movie is that when he's like legend. walking? I am legend. I am legend. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I like pull up to the curb and there's Amy with her mask on and then like 20 feet down the way, there's a guy with his mask on and then 20 more feet down the way and there's three cars there to pick these three people up, you know, and it was just like, wow. But anyway, but it was kind of cool because I think I was like forgetting how to drive. Like, you know, <laughs> so I was like, woo, driving. <laughs> so, but, um, but anyway, but Amy was able to bring up masks because in the Virgin Islands, because um, we're good at disasters, I guess, we have a lot of these supplies, except for ventilators. Although we got in the Virgin Islands, we had seven ventilators at the beginning of all of this to serve the entire Virgin Islands. Um, but they've now gotten another 119. So we have a total of 126 ventilators. And so far we only have 46 people who have the virus and of them, only six of them are hospitalized. So, um, so it's pretty good for the Virgin Islands and they're doing social distancing, which is a huge deal because in the Virgin Islands, you normally camp for Easter on the beaches and they have closed the beaches. And so no one's able to camp. So it's been this big social uproar because this is like a, this is a, like government shuts down yesterday, shut down yesterday at noon, doesn't reopen again until Tuesday because this is like a big deal. And, uh, and so it, the government shut down, but, um, but you're not camping on the beach this, this time. So anyway, but Amy was able to bring up a whole box of masks. So I have cool masks, like medical type masks. Um, and then I had ordered some from a friend of mine who is a currently unemployed uh, costume designer um, because, you know, she can't. Hey, Sean, I see your face. Um, oh, hey, Mario, look at there. So three days in a row, young man. Yeah, look at that. So um, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> okay, bye. Uh, Even Duvet's like, yeah. Hey, there's Duvet's face too. I'm glad to see faces. Oh, and who's Duvet? Who have you got with you? You got a you got a helper? And there's Niall. Hi, Niall. Like, hi. Hey. 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 That's my daughter, Elise. 
Hey, nice to meet you, Elise. So cool. <laughs> yeah, we're listening and uh, cleaning up the room at the same time. That sounds like a very good use of time. This is definitely a good Friday type activity. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so if y'all hear of any other good news stories, send them my way. I'm going to try and keep putting together good news every Friday. I think we all need good news. So, um, so tech stories, feel good stories, people helping people stories, all of the above are, are great um, to, to get. So, and I'll feed them all together and put this out every week so that we can Definitely stay positive. Nerd happiness spot for you. I think oh, also some like, just general people being good people, good news. Yeah, no, that's what I like about it. It's like both science and people being good people. And I love it when people are good people. That's, that's always a benefit. Hey, Lee? Yes. Uh, Jen, can we kind of share what we talked about yesterday? I think that would be good, um, yeah. good news as well. Or do you want to wait on that? Maybe it could be something for next week. I mean, you can spill the beans. I'm not ready for it, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, well, spill uh, the beans. Now I'm curious, what's going on? All right, well, well, Jen and I uh, spoke uh, yesterday, and listen, every time I talk with Jen for like 30 minutes, I can't, I can't go to sleep because I get so many ideas. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do for the group is like put together like a basically like a chasing your dream type session where we have. Uh, people that have uh, specialties, so maybe someone that does LinkedIn, Facebook, and all that type of stuff, and give it to um, our members as like a gift, like, hey, we know you're working from home. We want to be able to provide some content that you can actually use to maybe start, you know, helping your business out, or maybe if you had to close your business, do something where it'll help it as soon as it's able to open again. Um, yeah. So I, I think if we set it up the right way, um, I showed her like a little web conference that's going on right now, where if we use the Zoom, we can make it very engaging and kind of have like a slideshow and then people can walk away with something tangible that they can learn. That'll be cool. That'll be cool. I'm excited. Yeah, there's lots of, I, um, if you talk to Jen and Thompson and Juan, you know that I'm, um, constantly trying to overcome my IT limitations, shall we say, in terms what? of, yeah. So, so um, in terms of doing things like integrating apps and managing entire, my entire platform and being able to send documents easily between different apps. Um, those are the kind of things that I am learning on a daily basis. And I just have to say thank you to all everyone who keeps when I say, okay, I must have I called Tom like three times this morning. Okay, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to create my bit.ly links. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Something is wrong. Something is wrong. So um, anyway, so big thank you to everybody who's helping support and do the tech stuff on these little presentations I'm doing and everything else because it's pretty cool. So that's really all I had. Um, Happy Friday, everybody. Yay. Yay. So I think that's it. Unless anybody else has any other good ideas. Good news, good ideas. I went through sexual harassment training this week. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing to get out of the way, I guess. <laughs> oh, no. oh, right. did, they, did, did they revise it for like digital? Well, no, this was one of my clients and literally I, uh, before all this happened, I got fingerprinted because they wanted to have, have me more access to their intranet and different things. So literally, I had to, yeah, speaking of tech support and stuff, I had to set up this remote thing to their system. And then I was on tech support back and forth for like, you know, five or six calls. And I'd get a little further, a little further. But then I had to do two days of going through all their training material like a new employee does. <laughs> my brain just about was exploded <laughs> yeah. anybody else like what was their like big i found a, a video a friend of mine sent me this morning she's like oh, she's here before but uh where like this poor little girl was just like it had nothing to do with covid but like this woman wanted to this little girl wanted to be a farmer and or her mom asked her about being a farmer and she said i can't do that because i'm a little girl not a boy and I watched like all these videos of like 
country girls, farmer girls, like people I know. And they were like, you can do it. You can, I'm running a tractor too. That was like my big like moment. Of, yeah. you know, me going for the, yeah. the happy people, good the happy, people. The happy, good lifting things. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So Lee, since you've got into the technology now, I think that you should join me on somewhat of a regular basis for at least one of the segments of my uh, technology show every Tuesday. Cool. Your yeah. podcast, right? Podcast. No, that's on the radio. That's on WENG radio. Uh, it's syndicated on about 12 stations throughout the nation, actually including Hawaii. So you could truly be coast to coast. Oh, wow. There you go. There you go. That's cool. No, I'd love it. I, I, I love technology stuff. I mean, I just think it, I'm getting, so last night, okay, so this is how big of a nerd I am, right? So I had finished producing all this stuff and I'm also a lawyer, right? So like I'm, I'm kind of bounced back and forth between the, oh, this tech is really cool. And then the, what does this mean for the society as we know it kind of place? And I started thinking about this, the whole issue you were talking about, about sharing data and sharing technology. And I realized that I've never gone in and researched like programs like distributed computing, citizen science programs. Like what is, who owns that intellectual property at the end of the day when they do those programs? And I don't know the answer to that question. So that's my new side track. Oh, I'm gonna go research this and just figure it out because I'm sure there is something out there somewhere that says that, but I just kind of want to know like, okay, who, there goes my brother, <laughs> full on. Ever met him. <laughs> yeah, full on outfit. There we go. But um, but yeah, I was started thinking, I'm like, okay, so it's distributed science, it's citizen science, and, and we use citizen science in the Virgin Islands to do things like track lionfish and you know, uh, coral diseases and stuff like that. And the data uploads into a university site that we all can use, you know, kind of. Um and I just started thinking about that. I'm like, okay, so how does this all work? Like with something like dis discovering a, pr a novel approach to using a protein, you know, like who, who owns that? Right. You know, so anyway, I, I, and who gets to use it? Is it going to go into some biotech company somewhere and they're going to make billions of dollars off of it? Or is it now in the common, you know, the common ownership so that anybody can use it? Like, how does that work? So anyway, kind of interesting question, particularly with the biotech med stuff. Um, yeah, that's big because if all these you know, university and independent scientists are doing this and then some big corporation comes in and snatches up their, their work and makes all this money off it. Yeah, know. I mean, there's general stuff about like, and on the international level, like one of the things I find really, cause again, I'm a nerd, keep this in mind. You have to preface all of this with I'm a nerd. But um, also because I do a lot of, you know, I'm in the Virgin Islands a lot and we have a lot of um, kind of natural remedies that are, you know, kind of folk remedies or whatever, but there's a lot of actual science in the fact they work. I mean, they really actually work. And so I got interested in like who owns that, like that common heritage kind of stuff. And it turns out there's an entire um, international protocol for if you want to, like if you're a scientist and you want to go to Bangladesh and research a particular flower that, you know, that has a kind of natural or, or folk remedy, like what you have to do and how you have to share the proceeds that you generate from the products that you create using that. And each country actually has its own protocol of how this actually happens, which is kind of interesting. So I'm sure there's probably something similar, you know, dealing with this kind of global citizen science stuff, but I haven't found it yet. So, um, Anyway, future potential article for me to write when I actually have time to do things just for fun. <laughs> I've, also, I've also been, it's been in my uh, back of my mind that we got to maybe see about setting up some ops hours for uh, Lydia again, because I've been like, very curious about like, what's the IP on like virtual content? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. That's, that's like one of those things, like if you put it out, like how, how, like we're, we're recording some of these things. And like, once we put it out there, then what, you know, I don't know. Niall, do you know the answer to that? You create a lot of content. Muted. Oh, muted. Oh, we should have sent forward a bingo. We should have done that. Yeah. So my understanding is, is, um, you know, obviously, uh, you create it. It's technically, yours however um you know depending on the platform you're sharing on a lot of 
what you share may be considered public unless you state otherwise. Um, you, and, and unfortunately, there's not a clear line on that. So it gets into a really gray area. And the only way it's going to be resolved is obviously it's going to be litigated a few times. Yeah. And you know that will happen, especially like you're talking about with some of the things that are going on now. In my realm, yeah. a lot of it actually depends on, in certain cases like with Zoom and with some of the Facebook live stuff, if you read the small print and a lot of it, the platform itself claims ownership of the substance. <laughs> yep. Uh, as far as like digital contents, like memes and whatever, I digitally signed them all. So they're digitally watermarked. There's a black dot that I swap out that allows me to track IP and subnets of where everything is shared and used. Oh, that's cool. Um, but generally once it's out in the public forum, as far as unless you pre-copyrighted it or pre-trademarked it before you released it, then it's, it's public forum, it's public data. Uh, unless it's on a proprietary platform, then it often cases is the proprietary platforms. Yeah. Huh. Well, I guess I should, you know, send, Zoom should send me a thank you note then. <laughs> I've been helping them produce content a lot lately. So, <laughs> and lots of people, lots of thank you. <laughs> Yeah, if we're on a if we're on a private Zoom like this and it's it's it wasn't shared publicly, we have uh, a pretty safe assumption that the content remains private and it would remain with us. However, when you take that next step and say, "Oh, we might publish this on the net," you know, now all of a sudden that privacy veil has been lifted. It gets into the public realm, and again, there's just not a lot of precedence on that yet. Right. Oh, yeah. that's gonna be though now. <laughs> there, there certainly will be. Yeah, I'm, this summer, I'm, I'm taking a remote class from Berkeley on information privacy law. So oh, that um, would be cool. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to be uh, getting getting into the, the tech side of information privacy because I, I mean, I'm, I'm I, like I said, I'm a total nerd. I love this stuff. So. Um, so MIT shares an awful lot um, and they note when they do that. But yeah. I would suspect that they might be a good portal uh, or or container of information related to that. As a matter of fact, you didn't talk about it today, but they had developed back in, I think it was 2006, a ventilator that could be used, um, and it wasn't meant to be a permanent ventilator or anything like that, but it could be used for months um, for less than $100, and they completely released the plans and everything else to the public because a lot of the things they were doing were completely off the shelf and people could build it in no time at all. Yeah. But they released that publicly and declared it that way. Right. Yeah, no. And that's, I mean, a lot of the universities, if they're funded using national science foundation money, it, they have to release it uh, publicly. Like you can't, like if you, like if we do work in our labs that we're funded with the public funds to gather data, then that data goes into the public realm. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff about when you're doing a sponsored project where it's partially federally funded and partially, oh, look at you. You must have watched the video on how to look good on Zoom. Cause no, I just was looking at myself and I do some television sometime, although I generally have the backdrop up there and this is my television lighting. Oh, that's good. I need television lighting. I also need my hair done, but that's a totally different thing. Entirely. I'd like to have that problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hey, of course, we never have. That's exactly right, Gary. Never have a bad hair day. That's good. Uh, all right. Well, I'm glad you all joined us. This was, yeah. this was awesome. Every Friday at noon. Yeah, thanks for gathering all that information. My house is like, yo, shut up. <laughs> nerding out, geeking out on us with all that information. Yeah, well, don't worry. I, I can always serve up a nerd quotient. I'm good for that. So that that is me. There's everybody. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Yep. What was that?